Hi, today I'm going to share with you guys regarding Horner's syndrome, which is also called ocular sympathetic paresis. It comprises of a constellation of clinical signs, including the classic trial of ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. As you can see from this picture, there is a droopy of the left upper eyelid, which we call as ptosis. Usually, ptosis in the Horner syndrome is mild because the levator palpebral superioris is supplied by an intact third nerve. Secondly, you can observe that the pupil size is smaller, which we call as meiosis. This gives rise to anisocoria in which both eye the pupils are in different size. And then we have a reduce or absence of the sweating over the ipsilateral face, which we call it as anhydrosis. So other than this classical triad, we also have other clinical signs which include apparent endophthalmus because of this ptosis over the upper eyelid, as well as the inverse ptosis over the lower eyelid. We know that the lower eyelid is uh, controlled by the inferior tarsal muscles, which is supplied by the sympathetic plexus. So because of this dosis, it will give a patient an uh, apparent end of thomas. Besides that, patient can have high-risk hypochromia because of uh, the congenital or a long-standing Horner syndrome. This gives rise to heterochromia, which means a different color of the iris in both eye. Besides that, in the baby, we can see a harlequin sign in which when they are crying, they will have flushing over the contralateral side, but the ipsilateral side will appear to be pale. So this is, this, this is called a harlequin sign. And then the ipsilateral eye usually will have a reduced intraocular pressure because the ciliary body is also supplied by the sympathetic plexus. So whenever you get a patient with anisocoria, you need to determine whether the anisocoria is due to the problem with the small pupil or a problem with a big pupil. There is a list under the anisocoria which increases in the bright light as well as the anisocoria increases in the dim light. So we are, today we are focusing on the Horner syndrome, in which the anisocoria will increase in the dim light. This is because the dilator pupillae is supplied by the sympathetic plexus, which is affected. And then when we put the patient in the dim light conditions, the affected eye will not dilate as big as the contralateral eye, which is normal. When you put patient in the bright light, the big pupil will constrict normally. So this will reduce the anisocoria of a patient with Horner syndrome. To understand Horner syndrome, we need to understand the anatomy of sympathetic plexus. There are two important structures in the sympathetic plexus, which are First of all, the ciliospinal center of pouch located at C8 to T1 region, as well as the second one is the superior cervical ganglion. So these two structures further divide the sympathetic plexus into three parts, which is the first order neuron, also called as center neuron. Second order neuron, which is also called a preganglionic neuron and the third order neuron, which is also called as postganglionic neuron. So in the patients with a Horner syndrome associated with some brainstem sign, including ataxia, diplopia, nystagmus, or hemiparesis, hemiesthesia, or even a hornus of the voice, as well as dysphagia, which is a bulbar sign, we need to think of a brainstem lesion. If the lesion is further down in the spinal cord, patient can have sensory and motor abnormalities. They can also have bladder and bowel dysfunction, as well as 
erectile dysfunction in a male patient. If the lesion is further down, patient can have a brachial plexopathy in which they will experience pain or weakness over the hand or arm. So again, if the lesion is over the brain stem, it can be either due to a cerebral vascular accident, a tumor or demyelination. Lesion in the spinal cord can be due to a tumor, shingomelia, trauma or lateral medullary which we call as Wallenberg syndrome. So for, for a patient with second order neuron lesion, first of, the, first of all, it can happen at the apex of the lung, which can be due to a pancreas tumor or a trauma over the supraclavicular region. So you have to bear in mind, in a patient with a history of chronic smoker, presented with a Horner syndrome, you should suspect a pancreas tumor. Secondly, any lesion over the neck, which either caused by a trauma, a surgery, a tumor, or even a common carotid artery dissections can cause patients to have Horner syndrome. In the pediatric patients with a neck mass and also abdomen mass, the most common cause is neuroblastoma. For postganglionic neuron, if patient presented with a sudden onset painful Horner syndrome, we should suspect a internal carotid artery dissection. In the postganglionic neuron, it can also be caused by any lesion over the media ear or a cerebral or a cavernous sinus lesion. Media ear lesions include either otitis media or herpes zoster infections. Pathology over the cavernous sinus can be due to a cavernous sinus thrombosis or a tumor. And then if a lesion is over the orbit, it can be either due to a tolosa hahn syndrome or a tumor retrobalba, which is behind the globe. So bear in mind, for postganglionic neuron lesion, usually they don't have anhydrosis. This is because the supply by the sweat gland is by the pseudomotor and also the vasoconstrictor fibers to the face. So if the lesion is over the postganglionic, most of the time it's, it, is, it is spare the pseudomotor and the vasoconstrictor fibers. Hence, a patient with a third order neuron lesion, they don't have a anhydrosis. Also, if a patient with a cavernous sinus syndrome, they can also have some extraocular muscle movement problem because of the cranial neuropathy. Because we know that in our cavernous sinus, there are few cranial nerves which pass through it. 